Here. Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Present. Mr. Healy. Here. Ms. McCurdy. Here. Mr. Morris. Here. Mrs. Paradise. Present. Vice Chairperson Mr. Hill. Here. Chairperson Mrs. Granado. Present. And Weathersfield High School student representative Ms. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Aguiar. It's close. Present. Thank you. That's I'll get good. it someday. Just call soon. It present. <laughs> <laughs> All present. Thank you. Okay, the board is inviting a group of Emerson Williams. If I go through their names here, we have Sophia Cruz, Emma Cruz, Mirabel Quadras, Holden Gallagher, Lena DeMonte, and Joey DeMonte, and Emily Matatal. Could you come on up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay, thank you all. Nice job. Okay, Mr. Emmett, um, we do not have staff recognition tonight because of our presentation. That is correct. Okay. So next on tonight's agenda is the approval of the minutes of our regular Board of Ed meeting, which was held on October 9th, 2018. Are there any corrections? Okay, seeing none, um, do we have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Abstained. Abstained. Did you get those, Ellen? So Mrs. Evans and Mrs. Fitzpatrick? No. Abstained. Thank you. Okay, those minutes are approved. And is there anyone wishing to make a public comment? Come on up to the podium and please state your name and address. And may I remind you that you have a five-minute limit. Come on up. Good evening, Ken Lesser, 8 Hawthorne Way. Uh, I'll be brief, it's also the World Series tonight, so I wanna make sure the meeting moves along quickly and to all you Red Sox fans, good luck. But I'm here to say a big thank you uh, to the board, uh, to Bobby and Michael and the entire board for the support of the academy business model. Um, as you know, and thank you for it, we have an academy business coordinator, but I just want to update you on some of the things we have going that are really going to make a difference for our students. We are starting Lunch and Learns with business folks that are going to come in and talk to our students about lunch and learns. We're going to be doing interest, industry tours for our students at companies around Greater Hartford. We're going to have some job shadowing programs. And we just kind of started an agreement with the travelers where our students are going to be able to go into the travelers. These are great learning experiences for our students and it wouldn't have happened without the support of all of you folks. I'm super excited about what the possibilities are. Uh, I would like to invite any member of the board, any member of the public to come to our meetings. We meet, this is the Academy Business um, Advisory Board that gives some advice to uh, the coordinator and to the school. Uh, we meet the last Monday of every month. So our next meeting is next Monday, October 29th. We meet from seven to eight sharp. Uh, and we discuss ways that our students can get involved in the business community and how our business community can get involved with our students. Uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. I'm super excited about it, and I'm really here to say thank you and to listen to some presentations later. But thank you for your support. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Ken. It really is a great opportunity for our kids. Thank you. Where's those meetings, Bobby? Where? At the high school. At the high school. And those meetings are at the high school. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, Mr. Emmett, do you have communications to share? Yes, just a few this evening. Um, obviously, uh, we're very excited uh, this evening to be hearing a couple of presentations with regard to phase one of our enrollment study, as well as um, our facilities assessment. Um, as you all know, uh, we worked very hard uh, last year to develop and implement the Weathersfield Public School Strate uh, Strategic Plan 2018-2024. Goal number three with regard to management operations and finance 
action uh, two, conduct a facilities audit and make recommendations for 21st century learning spaces. Action 2.1, outline specific infrastructure priorities and develop long range plans to renovate or build new schools and explore redistricting. And action 2.2, to continue to audit infrastructure and procedures to ensure safe and supportive learning environments. Tonight, that is where we begin this step. Um, we have some excellent data um, that we'll hear from and we'll start the process of assessing where we're at and making some decisions moving forward. I'm certainly very excited. I think that uh, this evening you'll find that there is the most comprehensive set of enrollment data points that I think we've ever seen in this district. So certainly looking forward to that. Uh, a couple of other items in terms of an infrastructure item. Uh, I've been letting the board know we've struggled mightily with regard to the portables over at Highcrest and um, in consultation with Sally Katz in spite of multiple repairs, including roof repairs and drywall repairs, these portables have had it. They're done. Um, the, the smell from the water infiltration has gotten to the point where it, I don't feel it's safe for kids. And at this point in time, we do not have students in those portables. Uh, I will be meeting with folks on the town side as well as uh, uh, some of our folks here on the board side. Uh, to talk about what our process is going to be. Um, certainly right now, Ms. O'Connor is doing yeoman's work in terms of relocating occupational therapy and physical therapy, which um, was housed in one of the portables. The other portable was music classes. So we're doing music on a cart. It is not optimal whatsoever, um, but what we're doing is looking at the potential for the short term at least to replace those portables. Uh, I've been in contact with a colleague in Rocky Hill who recently purchased portables. So I have some ballpark figures. Um, we'll be meeting again uh, tentatively on the 5th of November to talk about uh, options. At this point in time, the first and foremost thing is we're going to be actually walling off uh, the hallway down to those portables uh, as uh, we're not going to be using them anymore. So again, kind of a pertinent thing to be talking about our facilities when we're at, at this point this evening. <clears throat> Uh, a couple of other brief items. I've had the opportunity last week uh, to go and visit the Farmington Public Schools and their building committee. Uh, they had reached out and asked about uh, how we got through our um, Renovate is New project at Weathersfield High School. Um, they are certainly grappling with the need to replace their high school. Um, and the figures that we heard last week were between 120 and $161 million for renovate his new project there. Certainly nice to be able to talk about what we did here in Wethersfield and how we saw things through. Um, and again, uh, moving forward, just so everybody knows, we're getting into that season where it is committee after committee, uh, evening events happening at schools. We've got a lot on the plate coming up, so please plan your calendars accordingly. It's gonna get really busy. And that's communications. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Michael? Okay, well, let's move on. So the board and the administration, as Michael said, have been working with Colliers International for a student enrollment and facilities assessment. So tonight, there's a school enrollment and demographic study by Malone and McBroom, followed by Collier's presentation of our elementary school facilities audit. So gentlemen. Okay, we'll be starting off with the uh, presentation from Patrick Gallagher from Malone McBroom. Pat will be talking about enrollment uh, historicals as well as enrollment projections up through 2028. Thank you for having me here tonight. I'm Pat Gallagher with Mylona McBroom, and we uh, were um, hired by the district to do a comprehensive enrollment and demographic analysis for the district. As part of any major um, renovation or construction or reconfiguration project, it's really important to understand a baseline of where your enrollment's uh, at today, um, what are some of the trends in the recent past, and uh, what are uh, trends looking like for the next 10 years. So um, just to give a brief background, um, 
I work for Milo and McBroom. We're a company based out of Cheshire, Connecticut. That's our headquarters. And um, I'm in our planning department. Uh, we do a lot of work with school districts, including many of your neighboring communities in recent years, um, shown in blue, are just some of the towns we've worked in uh, over the last several years and helping communities do everything from comprehensive enrollment plans to doing enrollment projection updates for budgetary purposes. Uh, Pat, excuse me, I'm sorry. If we have questions, should we save them to the end or just um, Yeah, or? let's save them to the end because I'm, I'm covering a lot of information, so I may cover something um, a little later. Thank you. No problem. All right, so before I dive into enrollment trends, I'm just going to give some general background information on the town of Wethersfield as a whole. And looking at your historic population, you are a very, very stable community. In fact, your population at the last census in 2010 was just six people higher than it was in the 1970 census. So you have been a remarkably stable community. Um, looking forward, we, uh, you look at two sets of population projections. One is put out by Connecticut Department of Transportation and the other by the Connecticut State Data Center. I'll, I'll caveat that population projections are not the same as school enrollment projections. Uh, nonetheless, we like to just look at these um, resources just to see what trends that they are showing. And uh, they're showing a continuation of that sustained um, stable population uh, for the um, DOT model and some slight growth with the state data center model. So we anticipate that overall your population will remain very, very stable for the foreseeable future. Oops. So being it's 2018, it, it's somewhat of a tough time for demographers because our, the main data set that we rely on is the decennial census. And so now we are about um, eight years removed from the last decennial census in 2010. So I will be showing some information from the dis, uh, last decennial census, but I'll be updating that with some estimates that are provided by the Census Bureau on an annual basis uh, in the in-between years. So this map here shows your population change by census tract, which is roughly a neighborhood. And overall, we see very stable populations throughout town. We had one uh, census tract that declined very, very, very smallly, uh, uh, slowly between 2000 and 2010. Really, usually that means there's high schoolers that graduate and, and move out. But um, really, we see uh, stable population across all neighborhoods of town. However, one of the m uh, main ways that towns are changing across Connecticut is an age composition. So while your population has been steady, you have different groups growing and, uh, and others shrinking. And um, like many of your suburban peer towns in Connecticut, your population uh, tree is hourglass shaped, meaning you have some big generations, such as the baby boomers and the millennials, uh, which are the uh, fatter parts of your population tree. And then you have some smaller um, age cohorts, which are the, the skinnier sections of the age, uh, the age tree. And really what we're seeing is the aging of the baby boomers and the aging of the millennials really being the two uh, trends shaping your community. And that's reflected in, in your school enrollment trends as well. When we look at overall median age, again, you've been very, very stable. Your median age has only gone up uh, by about a year since 2000. And in fact, um, estimates that we looked at that were provided by the Census Bureau for 2016 show that your females of childbearing age, so uh, females age 18 to 44, has actually increased between 2010 and 2016, um, which I'll get to a little bit, um, may explain some of the birth trends we've seen over the last few years. Student age population is another data set provided by the Census Bureau. Again, this is eight years dated, so some of the um, enrollment data that I'll, I'll provide you later for your school district will provide a much uh, more accurate snapshot of where you are today. However, nonetheless, uh, we found that between the last two decennial censuses, your student age population grew throughout town. So again, not a lot of variation in particular neighborhoods. Uh, females of childbearing age is, is really a proxy that we use to estimate future births, which then we use to estimate future kindergarten classes. And not surprisingly, as those baby boomers aged up into their uh, 50s and 60s, we saw a decline in females of childbearing age in just about every Connecticut town. Um, however, like I mentioned, there, are, there is some recent data to suggest that this trend has, has started to reverse itself. So births are one of the really important factors that we look at whenever we do an enrollment and demographic study because births are the best data that we have of estimating your future kindergarten classes five or six years from now. And out of all the towns that I've worked in since I've started, I've never seen a, a birth chart that is as stable as Weathersfield. Um, you've really had remarkable stability through the recession years where a lot of towns started to see a dip. 
Um, however, over the last four years, you've started to see a little more uh, variability. Um, 2014 was your lowest uh, birth cohort um, in recent memory, dropping down to uh, 213. However, the last three years, you've seen a, a pretty big uptick, and you're back uh, in 2016 and 2017 at those uh, median numbers. We also obtained the first six months of 2018 uh, birth data from the Connecticut Department of Public Health and extrapolated that out for the full year. And you're actually, if that pace continues for the second half of the year, you would be on track for your largest birth cohort um, in recent memory. And as I get into the enrollment projections, you'll see that the years that have smaller birth classes will, or cohorts will have smaller kindergarten classes, typically five and six years later. And if you have a larger uh, birth cohort, five or six years after they were born, you may see a, a spike in kindergarten enrollment. So these kind of fluctuate uh, together. One of the benefits of the data that we get from DPH is we actually get uh, births by address, which allows us to see if there's particular parts of town that um, are hotspots for births. And it also helps us hone in on the individual school projections. Um, and what we see is that uh, births are highest in your larger districts, not surprisingly. Um, so Hanmer and, and Highcrest, and smaller in your smaller districts. And what we've seen across the board is that there is some year-to-year -year variability, but um, overall everything is on uh, the, the same trajectory. What I'll point out here too is that your kindergarten class this year corresponded with about an average uh, birth cohort, so of 250 uh, births five years prior. Next year's kindergarten class will be corresponding with that low birth, uh, birth year of 2014. And as we get further and further uh, over the next three or four years, you'll start to see those uh, birth cohorts tick back up to the median. Employment trends is something that we follow just because it's um, sometimes a good indicator of housing turnover in migration. When times are good economically, folks are more likely to move into the community. And in Wethersfield and in Greater Hartford, the economy has improved uh, quite a bit since the recession. And um, right now, unemployment rate very low in town at 4% and trending below the, um, the uh, Hartford County average. So we see these uh, improved in economic conditions as one of the drivers of, of in-migration and partially explains why we've seen some greater in-migration over the last few years. Housing is another really important thing uh, to look at as part of any comprehensive enrollment analysis. You want to see what types of housing you have where. You want to see uh, what types of housing projects are in the pipeline and could impact your enrollment in future years. And um, this map here shows housing uh, change in housing units, so the number of units by neighborhood. And again, very stable across the board. You don't have any areas of town that are particular hotbeds for housing growth. Um, you're seeing that slow growth across the board, although we do have some major projects in the works, um, which I'll get to in a, in a few minutes. Householders uh, age 65 and over are one of the proxies that we use for housing turnover. So older, older homeowners are likely going to be the ones who are selling in upcoming years. And uh, this map shows the change in those elderly householders between 2000 and 2010. So the areas that are highlighted in red are areas where um, elderly, oops, excuse me, elderly homeowners have um, incre uh, decreased. So that's areas where that housing turnover has already started. And in uh, the southern part of town, in the Highcrest district, they actually increased. So we see this as really an area of potential future housing turnover. We also like to look at housing tenure. Um, areas that are owner-occupied tend to be more stable than areas that have a high pro pro uh, proportion of rent renter housing, um, which tends to be more transient. And um, this map here shows your percent renter occupied by census tract. And they're concentrated really along uh, Silas Dean Highway and in the northern end of town. So uh, one of the things that stuck out to us was the whole southern part of town um, around Highcrest School. And that census tract extends to Silas Dean Highway. And so the, the renter units that are in that neighborhood are really concentrated along um, the Silas Dean Highway and aren't really extending into that single family neighborhood by Highcrest School. Price point is another um, thing that we like to look at because um, oftentimes if you are in a community with school aged children, there's a good chance you may be looking to upsize if, if you have more kids. And one of the things that we look at when we look at 
housing price point is, are there opportunities to, to upsize or downsize within the same community? And overall, you have a very affordable housing stock, and you do have inventory on the higher end, and you do have inventory on the lower end, so that as, as folks, you know, make their um, moving decisions, they have plenty of options within the community. Again, speaks to that stable uh, population. Home sales are another great indicator of in-migration. When you have a lot of home sales, you're, you're more likely to see an uptick in in-migration amongst your district. And you've seen a, a very strong recovery since the, uh, the housing market crash in the uh, late 2000s. Home sales are back up to about 450 per year over the last three years, which puts you back at the same level as you had back in the early 2000s. So a very, very strong recovery. We did get um, year-to-date data, which we extrapolated out for the full year. And again, you're trending um, slightly higher than that 450, but um, very similar to the last two years. And um, sale price is also something that may influence the number of sales. And um, many communities across Connecticut still have um, housing that's, that's a, uh, more affordable than it has been previously. So it's really a buyer's market. And we see um, the affordability of housing really tied to that increase in sale in recent years. Uh, nonetheless, there has been a, a slow but steady recovery of home values since their, um, their low in 2011. We get home sale data by address, which allows us to look at trends influencing your individual elementary school districts. And what we found was that sales are up across the board across all of your elementary school districts since 2011. Um, but there is some geographic, um, interesting geographic trends. So Emerson, Emerson Williams, um, over the last three full calendar years, had almost 30% of the town's total uh, housing sales, followed by Hanmer and uh, Highcrest, with Webb and Wright having the smallest number of sales. So this map shows all of the housing sales in Weathersfield from 2015 through 2018 year to date. And this allows us to do a hotspot analysis. So the areas that are highlighted in that uh, in yellow uh, to dark red show the areas where you have the highest concentration of home sales. And what we found with this analysis is that really your hotbed is um, between um, Wells Road, Ridge Road, and Prospect Street, uh, really the area um, in the Emerson Williams district and part of the Hanmer district that has a lot of um, single family homes that are attractive for families, conducive to families with children. Housing construction is, is something to keep track of as you're looking to um, make major changes to your, to your school district. And uh, again, you are a very stable community over the last um, 20 years or so, there's been very limited new construction simply because you're a town that's built out. There's very limited vacant land that's available that someone can come in and, and build new on. Um, and so you've averaged just six new housing units uh, per year since 2010. However, we know that there are some major projects in the works um, that we need to look at as we're planning for enrollment over the next 10 years and beyond. So we spoke with the town planning department and we're able to get um, information on the major housing developments uh, that are approved. So these are, these are ones that have already submitted to planning and zoning and gotten uh, site plan approvals. And we have over 200 units of uh, multifamily housing as well as uh, two subdivision, single family subdivisions that are uh, larger than you've seen in, in uh, recent years. And these are the locations of, of those developments. We have the Borden multifamily development, which is in the Hanmer district. And then uh, the two single family developments, as well as Ridge 275, which is a multifamily development, are in the uh, Webb district. So looking ahead 10 years, we want to make sure that we account for students coming out of those um, proposed housing developments in your uh, enrollment projections so that there's space for them. And the best way to estimate that is by looking at comparable properties within town. So we picked some comparable multifamily developments and some comparable single family developments and looked at total number of units as well as um, how many students were coming out of them. For multifamily, there's a lot of variability based on number of one bedroom versus two bedroom units as well as price point. Um, and so what we ended up doing was taking an average across the three multifamily developments that we used as a sample. And on average, um, those multifamily developments produced 0.17 
Wethersfield Public School students per unit. On the single family side, we see um, we sampled um, some newer development and Due to the lack of large subdivisions built over the last 20 years, um, we picked um, streets that were newer, so I think built in the late 90s, or early 2000s, that had larger homes that we felt would reflect some of the new construction. And what we found was that you have a lot more students per unit coming out of single family homes, and um, they're a lot sim uh, more similar to one another than the multifamily developments. So the average for the comparable single family developments was 0.57 students per unit. We further broke that down um, by elementary, middle, and high school students because we want to know how many students um, will enroll in Hanmer versus uh, Silas Dean or the high school. And so we applied the, what are called those multipliers, those students per unit, to those new developments based on the number of units that have been approved. And um, this table here just shows the summary breakdown by uh, both um, school type as well as total. And so these um, housing projects, when they're completed, we estimate will add about uh, just over 50 students to Weathersfield Public Schools, which we have incorporated into your projections to make sure that, that um, they're accounted for. So now I'm going to pivot over to your enrollment trends. And I'll start by doing a look back over the last uh, 15 years or so. And again, you've been a very, very stable community. Um, you've had a slight decline over the last um, six, seven years. However, that decline is, is slower than, than many of your peer towns. And in fact, we've seen uh, growth at the elementary school level over the last uh, three school years. And generally, your elementary enrollment will be the first to tick up, and then middle and high school will follow in later years. We also looked at trends in your uh, individual elementary schools, and there's a little more variability here. Um, High Crest, we've seen enrollment uh, steadily increase over the last seven years, and your enrollment for this school year is the highest in recent memory. Uh, Hanmer and Emerson Williams have been generally stable. There are some fluctuations year to year depending on how large of a kindergarten class comes in and how large of a uh, sixth grade class matriculates up. Uh, Charles Wright has also been a very uh, stable school, and Webb has declined uh, slowly uh, over the last seven years. However, uh, 2018 did see a slight uptick. One of the more interesting um, trends that we want to um, monitor um, is enrollment of Wethersfield residents in Magnet, Charter, VOAG, or other programs outside of Wethersfield Public Schools. And um, I'll point out that the 2018-19 data is uh, preliminary, and I think the other is, is um, um, the, the data set provided by the state. But nonetheless, you can see just how many Wethersfield residents are attending these other schools outside of the Weathersfield Public School District. And we've seen a decline over the last four years, pretty, pretty substantially, with um, overall enrollment being about 100 lower than it was four years ago. One of the major changes has been at the pre-K level, where uh, there's recently been changes to um, tuition. So it used to be a free program for CREC, and then now I believe um, if a family makes over a certain amount, they have to pay for pre-K. So it's somewhat less enticing to enroll in that program as it had been in years past. And if these students uh, return to Weathersfield Public Schools, that could be a significant impact on your enrollment trends. Another uh, program to um, evaluate is the Open Choice Program. So these are Hartford residents who attend Weathersfield Public Schools through the Regional Open Choice Program. And that has grown uh, particularly at the middle and high school level in recent years as you have larger classes matriculating up. But in general, uh, enrollment's been close to 100 students, and your elementary enrollment has been between 50 and 60 students. We did an analysis where we looked at your new to district students um, for the last three school years and tried to tie them to home sales. Um, Home sales are traditionally one of the uh, major drivers of in-migration, but what we noticed is in Weathersfield is that um, most of your new to district students are not tied to a home, home sale. So 75% um, were either living at that address prior, so they could be a magnet student or a parochial student re-enrolling in Weathersfield, or they could be a renter or uh, moving in with another family member. So that was a very uh, interesting trend that's, that's driving some of the new to district students. 
This map shows the hot spots of new to district students, and not surprisingly, it corresponds with your highest uh, density rental housing. Rental renter housing tends to be more transient than single family areas, and while you do have a sizable number of folks moving uh, in, in single family homes, they're all not concentrated together. So um, I believe these are uh, Folly Brook apartments in the northern end of town, and then the Weathersfield Housing Authority property in the middle of town. All right, so now I'll get into our enrollment projections. And we take all of that background, economic, housing, and demographic data, and use those to inform our projections models. And these are based on the underlying assumptions that we build into the model. So uh, assumptions on housing, assumptions on birth, uh, births, assumptions on housing construction. And we create several models and try to test which ones best align with the numbers that we're seeing on the ground. We use what's called the cohort survival method. This is the um, standard in the industry, and this is what's uh, preferred by the uh, State Department of Education whenever you're submitting a, a school construction grant. And really, the, the main uh, premise is that it's observed data from the recent past is the best indicator of the near future. And in a stable community like Weathersfield, um, it's, it's a great methodology. Another key to our enrollment projections is what's called persistency ratios. And that essentially tracks how much a grade grows or shrinks as it matriculates through the system. So this slide here shows your persistency ratios. And I apologize, it's probably too small to see in the audience. But persistency ratios over one mean that a class is growing as it matriculates through the system. And a persistency ratio under one indicates that it's shrinking. And what we see is that almost across the board, your, your incoming kindergarten classes are growing just about every year as they matriculate up to 12th grade. So slow levels of in-migration. The one year um, over the last five years where, oops, um, where you don't have it is uh, fifth to sixth grade, which maybe folks pulling out their um, children to attend um, Magnet or, or other um, non-Weathersfield public school middle schools. And typically, the transition years are the only uh, are the ones that are most likely to have a persistency ratio of under under one. Another uh, metric that we use is what's called the estimate of migration on the far right hand side, and that tracks uh, changes in grades one through seven as they matriculate up to two through eight, which tend to be the more stable grades. F uh, folks are less likely to move in or out. And what we've seen is over the last two years, you've had a, a very marked uptick in your migration for those grades. Uh, with this year a migration of uh, over 3.5%. The most challenging thing to pr uh, project is your future kindergarten enrollments because we don't have a count of all the zero to four year olds that are living in your community. And so births are the best proxy that we have for estimating your future kindergarten classes. And um, we do that by looking at what's called the birth decay persistency ratio. So comparing kindergarten enrollment with the uh, comparable birth uh, cohort five years prior. And so what we've seen is that on average, uh, every 100 births uh, will, uh, will lead to 97 kindergartners enrolling in Weathersfield Public Schools five years later. And this has been fairly stable, although, although there is some year-to-year -year variation. And this past year uh, was one of uh, just two times in the last several years where you've had more kindergartners than uh, you had births five years prior, so a, persis a persistency above one. In, uh, when we estimate your next five incoming kindergarten classes, we can rely on observed birth data that we have for uh, the town of Weathersfield that's provided by the Department of Public Health. However, to project your last five kindergarten classes going out to 28, 29, um, we need to estimate the number of births that are going to happen over the next five years. And we've built um, a low, medium, and high regression model based on, um, I believe, housing and economic factors to create these high, medium, and low birth scenarios. And overall, um, we're estimating that, you're, again, you're going to follow that very stable um, average of about 260 to 275 per year in our medium model, which we see as our most likely. All of this gets fed into our, our district-wide enrollment projections. And as I... I mentioned with the births, we prepare a high, medium, and low, um, with the medium being what we see as best reflecting uh, where the community is headed over the next 10 years. However, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know if, you know, maybe there will be a, a big boom in births, you know, three years from now, or the economy will be booming, or the opposite. 
And so we provide a high and a low just to help you be nimble in the event that some unforeseen changes happen. However, we feel very confident in our medium model as reflecting um, the stability of your community and where you're heading. And we have added those housing multipliers into all of the projections that I'll show you on the coming slides. So 50 students total, um, and then we've allocated them to the individual elementary school that aligns with that proposed housing development. So from here on out, I'm going to show the medium, again, that preferred model that we see as most likely occurring over the next 10 years. And what we've seen in the last few years is an uptick in elementary enrollment. Um, and we see that trend, continue, uh, that slow growth in those elementary uh, classes continuing over the next 10 years. Um, you will notice over the next two years, there'll be a slight dip. That corresponds to those two small birth cohorts entering kindergarten. And as we get those larger birth years starting to enter is when we start to um, increase in the later years of the projections horizon. So the black line represents your historic over the last 10 years, and the blue dash represents your projected going forward 10 years. So by year 28-29, we're anticipating that your enrollment's going to be very similar to what it was in 2009-2010. We've also prepared uh, projections by school to help you track um, if growth is going to occur in um, particular elementary school districts. And what we found is that, um, in general, that growth is going to occur um, throughout the community, um, Emerson Williams being the one school that's very stable. If you were to compare the 2018-19 uh, current year enrollment with uh, 10 years out, and then the remaining schools um, growing slowly over the next 10 years uh, before stabilizing it. Um, the high 1900s by year 10. Um, we do see um, some, some growth at uh, Wright, Webb, um, lower growth at Highcrest, but growth nonetheless, and then um, some pretty uh, modest growth at Hanmer, um, which is going to be where the Borden apartments are. So that accounts for the uh, new students coming out of that Borden development as well. At the middle school level, um, we we are dealing with mostly students who are already enrolled in Weathersfield Public Schools. So the data is known, and um, there's always greater confidence in projections of, of students who are already in the system. And what we're showing is a very stable enrollment over the next 10 years with uh, some fluctuation between 540 and 580 students, just depending on how large of a 7th grade class moves up and how large of an 8th grade class moves on. And at the high school level, we also see a very, very stable enrollments. Uh, varying between 1,100 and 1,200 uh, over any given year, but in general, very, very stable. The final piece um, of the puzzle that um, was part of our, our study was to look at um, your space and develop capacities for each school building. Um, I'll note that uh, I'll note um, that I'm not an architect, so our, our um, charge was really to focus on your instructional rooms and your space and your programming and how many students you can fit into the building. Um, there's a lot of uh, facilities deficiencies that Chuck and Chip will mention in their presentation. So to start, our, uh, to start developing capacities for each school, we need to get an idea of how space is used. Uh, we sent out um, questionnaires and, and floor plans to all of the uh, uh, building principals and asked them to mark up what space is used for full-time uh, full instruction, uh, what's used for electives, enrichment, uh, special programs, et cetera. We, I, I will uh, point out that Highcrest and Wright are the two schools with uh, modular, uh, modular classrooms. And uh, as the superintendent mentioned before, the uh, modular classrooms at Highcrest are no longer in use. The two modulars at Wright, uh, I believe, are used for grade level instruction. When we're looking at space and capacity, we also want to factor in the many district-wide programs that um, your students rely on. So this includes uh, pre-K. So there are, um, I believe, three pre-K classrooms at, um, at Webb. You also have other special programs that aren't necessarily in every school but need to be in a school. Uh, that includes the ABA program, uh, the STRIVE program, as well as your ELL uh, programs as well. So as we're developing capacity uh, for each school, we want to make sure that you're maintaining these uh, vital programs. So the method that we use for developing the, the planning capacity is um, sections, the sections per grade method. Uh, typically neighborhood-based elementary school districts such as yourself will have equal numbers of 
kindergarten sections as they do fourth grade sections. And um, neighborhood-based school districts tend to be more stable, so um, we've divided up your schools into either a three-section per grade school or a two-section per grade school. So this shows um, our total full-size classrooms for each uh, school based on our inventory. However, we can't use all of those uh, classrooms for grade level instruction. Um, so we've uh, assigned a school as either being a three section per grade, which is Hanmer, Emerson Williams, and Highcrest, or two sections per grade for uh, Webb and Wright. So that gives us, for the three sections per grade, 21 instructional classrooms, uh, and for the two sections per grade school, uh, 14 instructional classrooms. We then multiply that number of instructional classrooms by 25 students as a loading level and then multiply that by 0.9 to allow you uh, some headroom because we don't want to plan for the maximum or, or plan for large class sizes. I'll note that um, Webb is a large school. However, our um, capacity is only for K-6. So because you have the pre-K classrooms there and because you have the ABA programs in that space at Webb, um, that's why it's a two-section per grade school. It hypothetically could be a three-section per grade school, but it, it would require you to move pre-K or ABA to another building, which would then lower its capacity. As a general uh, rule of thumb, uh, districts typically strive for uh, what's called an 85 to 95 percent utilization. So that divides your enrollment by the planning capacity of the building. And so a utilization of between 85 and 95 percent means that you're using space efficiently, but you're not um, jam-packed, uh, and therefore you still have a little bit of flexibility. You're not having to put art on a cart um, or um, put other programs in undesirable locations. So utilization essentially compares uh, enrollment to capacity, and we've done this for each of your schools and looked at it um, over the next 10 years based on that medium enrollment projections model. And what we see is that district-wide, your utilization is in that 85 to 95 percent now and for the next few years. However, by year 10, you're starting to exceed that 95 percent threshold and there may be some, some space concerns. There's a lot of variation, however, within the individual elementary schools. Um, a school like Wright, um, based on the two sections per grade capacity, um, is over 100 percent capacity now. And actually, I believe they use um, 15 classrooms instead of 14 um, because they have some, um, some larger classes. Your other schools vary between um, today in 2018-19 uh, between 75 percent at Hammer um, to uh, 96 percent at Highcrest. If we look 10 years out, though, we see that Highcrest uh, is another school that um, is getting above that 100 percent utilization. And that is uh, that took into account using those modular portable classrooms. So without those two classrooms, um, it's even more jammed for space at that school. And then also uh, Webb starting to exceed that 95% utilization by year 10. And uh, Hanmer and Emerson Williams generally staying in that um, 85 to 95% range with uh, Hanmer being slightly lower. We also looked at middle school capacity because we, we um, wanted to make sure that we were seeing if there was excess space there that could perhaps be used um, for other programs. And um, we use a slightly different method for middle school just because it's based on teaming. Um, it's not just a standalone classroom that students are in the whole day. So we took your total number of instructional and science classrooms, uh, applied that 25 student loading level, and then multiplied that by five-sevenths, so assuming that it was uh, occupied for five out of seven periods out of the day. And that gives us a capacity of about um, just under 700. Um, both the middle and elementary school capacity studies uh, tables will show um, what's called the EDO 50 capacity. That was done by the state several years ago, um, and it is slightly higher for the middle school and just about equal uh, district-wide for the elementary school, so we feel that these capacities are pretty reflective. Um, of the buildings. And what we find uh, at the middle school level is that you have enough space. Your utilization today is at about uh, just under 80 percent, and um, that's comfortable to hold seventh and eighth grade for the foreseeable future. However, we do not see enough space in that building to move sixth grade up. Um, that would put it way over 100 percent. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Anyone have any questions for Patrick? 
John? I actually have a question oh. on the u elementary utilization mm -hmm. chart, which was close to the end there. Um, when a um, school goes over 100%, would that be, I mean, could you draw a parallel between that and say, now you have classes of 27 instead of 25? Yes, yeah, so inevitably, if, if you're at a utilization over 100%, the two choices are either you move into another classroom, so you're displacing you know, art or music or another program, or you have large class sizes. So those are typically the, the two solutions. But the data that we have now doesn't um, track individual cohorts so that we would know, say, for instance, that Emerson Williams would have need six grade fives mm -hmm. in year 2018. So we do have individual grade projections for the schools for the 10 years that are included in our projections. Um, the further out you get, the less confidence we have in you know the incoming kindergarten, but it could give a general ballpark of the number of sections that you'll need at each school. Okay. But that's not, I didn't miss that. That's not in this presentation. Correct. So this is just dividing the total students by the total capacity without looking at sections. Okay. Thank you. Okay, John. So we have a referendum issue coming up in November regarding mm -hmm. the purchase of some open space, a former farm in town. Mm -hmm. And well, none of us knows whether it will be approved or not. Um, if it is not, it is likely to become a development mm -hmm. of some sort. Is there any way to have some... Um, uh, can we figure out how, what the impact of that would be on some of the others? Because that would be in the High Crest District, which yep. is at a very high utilization rate. Yeah, so we're, we're aware of that, um, that that referendum coming up and are monitoring it closely. And um, the best explanation I would have would be to go back to the housing multiplier slide. So um, typically we won't do a multiplier unless it's an approved development. But to give you an idea of, you know, if we have 0.5 seven students coming out of the single family comparable properties, you would multiply that by however many units could fit on that property as a subdivision. So um, typically we won't, we won't include it unless it's approved, but you can help track various what if scenarios um, by looking at the housing multipliers and doing kind of a what if analysis. But we are aware and we'll be tracking it closely as you move into the later phases. Okay. I, I had a second question, mm -hmm. if I could. Go ahead, Jen. Is, is there any um, data that we can get that would tell us how reliable some of these figures are as we go forward? I understand the farther out we go, the less yes. relevant, but yeah, obviously, so, you know, how much can we lean on this? Yeah, so for enrollment projections, um, we strive for between 1% uh, accuracy per year. So within 1% in year one and within 10% in year 10, uh, we always hit that mark. Um, we, we are very confident in a town like Wethersfield um, however, like you mentioned, there is, there is uncertainty going out 10 years from now. I don't have a crystal ball, um, which is why we provided you with that high and that low projection um, to help you in your planning study of you know, accounting for unknowns that are uh, in the years ahead. And as you go through um, later phases and, um, and get into you know, specific projects, uh, and your enrollment study is going to be something you're going to want to update along the way. You don't want to be relying on five-year-old enrollment projections um, in, in your plan five years from now. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else for questions? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. That was a lot. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. All right, now at this point in time, we're going to uh, shift gears from the enrollment data into the uh, nuts and bolts with our facilities assessment. Joining us this evening is uh, Chuck Warrington and uh, Chip Phillips from Colliers International, uh, who were tasked with assessing our elementary schools. All right, uh, thank you, Superintendent Emmett. Uh, my name is Chuck Warrington. I'm with Colliers International, and my colleague Chip Phillips. 
uh, is with me this evening. Um, similar to Malone McBroom, uh, we're based out of Madison, Connecticut. Um, similar to Malone McBroom, we do serve many of your uh, neighboring districts and, and throughout the state, um, also Massachusetts, Rhode Island. Um, we have two basic divisions of our company, um, owner's project management, which is, which is what we're part of. Uh, and then the other half of the house is what we call our commissioning services. Those are our MEP and energy um, folks who um, help along with schools as well. You've heard, you know, Connecticut High Performance, I'm sure you dealt with that with the high school. Um, we, they actually do some of the commissioning services for that. Um, we, education is, is, is our primary sector. Uh, probably 90% of our, our work is education, um, a lot of public and private uh, uh, sectors. Um, so this is, this is what we do um, in the planning and helping districts uh, plan for projects, uh, whether they're one-offs or a master plan um, that you're looking at right now. So we're very familiar with that. Um, in the last couple of months, Chip's gone through the elementary schools along with our MEP folks to evaluate the physical conditions um, of those schools to help along with the enrollment um, projections to give, help give us a benchmark of where you're at um, so that we can, in the next couple of steps, evaluate what are the options uh, for your strategic plan uh, in moving forward. There's going to be a lot of options, and this, this data uh, tonight is going to help us uh, move in that direction. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Chip to let him um, present our FCA findings. And uh, if you have any questions during it, it's up to you, Chip. If you want to ask as we go, um, we're open to open dialogue as we move along. Yeah, for me, you know, I don't feel you need to save. I think it's, you know, a lot of these are, are somewhat technical, so I want to make sure that things are clear as we go forward. So feel free to let me mm -hmm. know if you have any questions along the way. Um, as Chuck mentioned, what we're uh, doing is what we call a facilities conditions assessment, or FCA, uh, focusing on repairing the buildings, uh, particularly focused on the elementary schools right now, looking at existing conditions. And I'll give you a little bit of definition in a moment. Um, as part of the process, we uh, had our team go through each of the elementary schools. We looked at all of the building spaces. Uh, we looked at all the major building components, looked at the exterior shell, the roof, the windows, the doors, the interior finishes, uh, the you know, ceilings and flooring and, and walls and, car and interior doors, uh, mechanical, electrical plumbing, heating systems, <laughs> any air conditioning, electrical plumbing, all of those systems, as well as any um, you know, regulatory items that we would see. During that, we met with all of the principals and head custodians to have a conversation about um, what some of the priorities that they see uh, on the condition of the building. And, uh, you know, it, we do want to recognize that we're not looking at hazardous materials. There are so many unknowns to that and uh, requires testing uh, that we're really looking at. We're doing uh, visual inspections uh, to look for signs of uh, need and you know based on what we're what we're seeing as well as age of equipment and systems we did identify over 350 items across the buildings uh, that we'll look at summaries obviously we're not going to go through all 350 of those today i want to start with a little bit of a definition uh, for deferred maintenance because that really is what we're talking about it's it's about fixing items that are beyond their useful life and usually items are beyond their useful life because of two reasons. One, funding. Nobody ever has enough money to do everything that needs to happen at its life cycle. And the second is uh, a lack of a comprehensive uh, identification process. Everybody has their CIP projects, but there's, there's, you know, nobody generally has the time and the expertise to go through and identify every item that needs to be done. So it's hard to make decisions about what you're going to do, and more importantly, what you're not going to do and why. So those two pieces really are, are what we're helping to fulfill is the identification of, of all of the items as well as starting to plan for how to address those down the road. Um, want to be clear, though, that these are not program alterations. They're not modernization because of program changes. These are repairs and upgrades to bring the buildings to current standings as they currently are. So we're not moving walls. We're not expanding, um, you know, building additional classrooms or any of those things. This is really fixing what you have and bringing it to current standards. Okay. I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about some of the big things that we saw. 
Uh, and you know, we're not list, I'm not going to list every item. Um, many of these are across multiple schools. Uh, but as I go through, I'm also going to show you some pictures of some examples um, of, of what some of the items that we've talked about. First of all, I do want to say that as we walked around all the schools visiting, it was very clear that all the schools are safe and well maintained. They're all clean. Uh, but in many cases, you know, what you're seeing is signs of age, not signs of neglect. And I, you know, that's, that's very important and clear, I think, to, to make sure that everybody understands because, again, this is a funding and capital issue much more than a maintenance issue. There are many of the schools that look great uh, because past projects really have focused on the architectural uh, aesthetic side of things. New, new, car, new uh, vinyl flooring, for example, uh, painting, ceilings, things that make it look and feel um, newer. However, that same attention has not been placed on the real infrastructure of the buildings, the mechanical systems, the electrical systems, the roofs, the windows. Um, you know, those are big ticket items that, that cost a lot of money, generally have longer lifespans, but once you miss those, it, they do start to deteriorate at a faster pace. So some what we're talking about is roof replacements that are needed at all five schools. Um, you, know, the, you know, again, these pictures are, are representative of areas where you see um, the tar through the, through the uh, stone. Uh, the um, skylights there at Emerson Williams are crackling and crinkling and have uh, a number of patches on them. You have ponding water that will find its way inside and also will shorten the uh, lifespan of the roof. There's, you know, gutters there that are, um, yeah, the words are under there, but they're under the, the, uh, the toolbar there, uh, that are um, leaking. So you can't really see the drip as well. as It's not as dramatic. Um, but, you know, so that, you know, those are real issues right now uh, where uh, every building is really facing significant roof issues. Many of the windows are very old, original, single paned. Um, you know, the old wind, wood windows at Highcrest, uh, single pane, you know, hoppers at, at Webb. Emerson Williams, they are double pane, but um, most of the... Um, the seals are gone, so they're all cloudy. You can't really see through them well. And the caulking really is starting to go around them as well. There's exterior masonry repairs. You see uh, at Emerson Williams, the chimney is in pretty rough shape, as, and there's a lot of bricks spalling. That's where water gets into the brick and starts blowing it apart. So you lose the face of those bricks, which just then starts to build on each other. Every winter, water gets in, freezes, the ice pops out, and you have a, a bigger and bigger problem. The chimney at Webb has a, a number of, uh, you know, pretty severe cracks in it. And at Hamner, the precast around the, the um, univentilator louvers, in many cases, is cracking and really starting to crumble. HVAC equipment, the heating, ventilating, air conditioning. Um, you know, the Hamner boilers are original, 1967, as well as that air handling unit. Charles Wright, you know, that, that's a uh, domestic hot water boiler from 1985. Um, you know, 33 years old. Uh, those don't have 33-year-old lives generally. Uh, the air handlers there are a little newer. They're from 1996. Uh, generally, a rooftop unit, you've got to figure 15 years. <laughs> um, these are, you know, constant repairs. Um, parts hard to get, and they've already had to replace uh, one of them so far, and the rest are coming. And Emerson Williams still has an old steam system through much of the building. <clears throat> So many, many of these systems are just outdated and not efficient systems in addition to their age. The newer systems that we're, we're putting in the newer schools or renovation projects like the high school, uh, certainly uh, higher efficiency as well. So. A higher efficiency as well as better control. So you get, um, you know, not only do you save money but, uh, on, on, a, on, a, on the per square base, foot basis, but also you have better comfort because they are uh, easier to control and, and provide more um, consistent heating and cooling through all the spaces instead of a lot of rooms where you have the hot spots and cold spots throughout each of the seasons. Electrical service, um, you know, m many of them, the main system has not been, uh, not been upgraded. You know, these are uh, systems that were put in before computers, before all the electrical usage we have now. 
And, you know, even in a place like Webb that did receive a lot of attention, um, you know, the majority of the electrical systems were not included in the scope of that work. Here in this case, you've got uh, an old Federal Pacific panel at Charles Wright. Uh, Federal Pacific went out of business in 1995. Uh, parts are almost impossible to get now. Um, so, I mean, they've been out of business. There's been no Federal Pacific since 1995. And the other one you can see at the top of the breakers, you can see burn marks where, uh, you know, an incident occurred at some point. It's like my house. <laughs> <laughs> also, in the interiors, the classroom casework, uh, for the most part, is uh, original. You know, these are the, what the, the uh, teachers are using to store their uh, books and materials, and they've got sinks, you know, none of which meet today's uh, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act standards. Uh, metal casework that is starting to rot out at the bottom. Uh, wood casework that's uh, crumbling and needs to be refinished. All the, the uh, laminate where the doors are broken and hanging. Um, and even at the one at Highcrest, you start to see where plumbing has failed and they've had to repipe re uh, some of the sinks outside the walls. Toilet rooms are pretty tired, outdated in a number of these, uh, the buildings uh, where there's been, you know, renovations for ADA that have been somewhat incomplete, as you see at Emerson Williams. Um, the you know, those floor-mounted toilets no longer meet code and standard today. Um, even the, the full bathroom at Hamner where, you know, it's an old ADA bathroom that where the stall is out, that now the stalls are supposed to be five feet, you know, five feet radius. Those are too narrow to, for today's standards. Uh, the sink there doesn't have uh, the required insulation on the piping underneath. So, you know, there's, it it's, was, did meet ADA back in the 90s, but today it does not meet ADA standards. And you see a lot of partitions, particularly in the boys' rooms, uh, that are all deteriorating, rotting, because they're boys and that's what they do. <coughs> Site improvements, parking lots, um, seeing a lot of the pavement that's really cracking now. Uh, you're seeing um, that the middle one for Emerson Williams shows a uh, displaced um, catch basin where you now have ponding water that will freeze in the winter and become, uh, you know, a, a, a concern. Uh, the steps at Charles Wright have no mortar in them, just all open, and again, you get more of the freeze thaw, and those will deteriorate faster and faster, as well as the wall around the basketball court at Highcrest. And the modulars. Highcrest, we've talked about. Um, there's a, you know, from water intrusion, there was a lot of damage that you saw around the windows and the sills. Um, the stairs were a problem. The doors were, uh, the, are rusting out in the corridor. Um, also, Charles Wright has issues uh, with, with the trim work and water getting in and starting to rot out, um, you know, behind the walls. So both of those really are beyond where they should be on repair and, and need to be considered, you know, what the real uh, future of those buildings are, you know, not only at high crust. And, and this, is, this is very typical in many districts, not, not just Wethersfield. Um, they're meant as temporary solutions. Uh, we always say temporarily, temporarily permanent. Um, and they end up being there for 20, 25 years, almost as, as old as some of the, uh, the schools themselves. Yeah. The, the original, it's not bricks and mortar. It, it is, you know, two by four construction. T, you know, T111 plywood type siding. Uh, the roofs are, aren't meant to be a, a 25, you know, 20, 25, 30 year warranty. So you, you, you end up wearing them out, but then we, the districts try to do these repairs, um, makeshift here and there, uh, as, as the superintendent alluded to, and Sally Katz has been trying to, they've been trying to make repairs. They just wear out after time and eventually got to take them offline as they've, have, as they've done at high crest. And, and, this is one major issue as we're talking about the future steps. Um, the state does not want to see portables. Uh, I, I can attest to that. Uh, they do not want to see that. They do want to see bricks and mortar. So as you're developing these plans, they want to replace that with permanent structure. Yeah, I mean, generally, you can think of these buildings as seven-year buildings. And I, as far as I know, I think these were put in in 2000. So they've been here 18 years. And it shows. So 
you know, there's a lot of, of observations that we've seen, pictures we took. What does it mean? Uh, obviously, as we said, it's a financial issue. So let's get into that. Um, the total of all of the projects that we looked at comes out to almost $32 million across the five elementary schools. Now, every project is not equal. Some things you know, are more important than others. Some things are, are, have more of a time frame to them. So we look at uh, priorities. Generally, um, as we objectively look at um, each of the issues, we like to think if money wasn't an issue, when should you do this? Mm -hmm. And so we think about priority one being, you know, boy, these things you really should do in the next three years. The next grouping would be the next five years, and then kind of beyond five years, the next five to ten years would be the priority three. Um, so as you know, as, as as we looked at the projects again, that total thirty-two million dollars. Uh, the priority one need, that most urgent need, is seventeen million dollars. Still a big number but a more manageable number as you, as you think going forward. And I think it's important to, again, reiterate these don't include the major uh, hazardous materials abatement projects that may be included in these buildings. If it's flooring, mm -hmm. there's a, a, a vinyl uh, asbestos tile that would be included, but not like necessarily Hamner. in the, the, the buildings as a whole. So, and that number's, that's a unique number that we take on a case-by-case -case basis and how you manage those, so that's why those aren't included here. Um, and, and also, and I think Chip alluded to before, this doesn't take in, uh, into account programming. This is purely physical assessment of uh, the buildings. It's not taken into account um, uh, anything other than the physical um, the conditions of it, the severity of them. Um, that comes into play later on um, in other districts where they develop a full CIP plan, a 10-year plan. Now where do we put these projects in relation to each other? Maybe programming does have a higher uh, evaluation and a criteria in, in, in how you order those, so. Yep. Are these priority levels, are these across all five buildings at the same time? Yes. So this wouldn't be like taking one project at a time in one building and moving on. We'd be doing something in all five. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, the you know, there's there's kind of two ways to think about priorities. What we're doing is looking at the priority, the urgency of the condition that we see itself. Um, once you start putting together a strategy on how to address these needs and how to address uh, changing demographics and program needs, there's going to be a reprioritization that that balances those needs across you know each of those functions. And that comes into play with the administrators and your central office of where the priorities lie. Do we change that boiler, that HVAC unit out versus maybe incorporating some security needs at a school that you have? And that's that's the subjective part that that we really can't um, have much input on. We're part of the discussion, um, but we can't really prioritize in that manner uh, for that. Yep. A quick question. <clears throat> sure. Um, all this says no uh, materials abatement and all that. You've been to Han Hamner was built in like the 60s mm -hmm. or something. Sure. So it's definitely going to come there, into play in here. Yeah, there's Is there any sort of like range that there, there's some that things average? like I mean, it's a lot of money to do that. So well, just you know, for instance, the the v, the VAT flooring that is clear and obvious. We you know we we did factor some of the costs into that. Where we don't get into it in, in much detail is like PCBs. You know, we've got window replacements in all these buildings. We don't know what's if if you know PCBs are come into play. Uh, you don't necessarily want to test that until you have a project because there's just a, a you know a whole host of, of repercussions from from doing that. And you know, so you don't know whether it's just in the caulk, whether it's leached into the masonry, whether it's dropped into the grounds. There's no way at this point until really undertaking a, a design for that for that project to know what the extent of that is. Um, so, you know, where we see, you know, obvious or, you know, most likely asbestos insulation, floor tiles, you know, glue daubs above ceilings, we, 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 we do recognize some of those things that are, that are clearly and defined within that scope. Okay. But so many of the other hazardous material okay. kinds of yeah. things, until you get and understand what the full scope of your project is, there's no way of even estimating what that's going to okay. be. Yeah, that's definitely where the hazmat consultant 
We always think it's important. Know what you know, know what you don't know. We, we, we know enough to talk about it, but we stay out of that realm and we hire those experts, the Fuss Aaron. and O'Neills, who you're familiar with, and Logan yes. McBroom yes. and, and Langan. Yes. So we, uh, we, we're, we're, we, with respect to the numbers, I'm sure you've heard plenty of times before to throw out a number that ends up sticking. So that's one thing we, we and, do want right. to. Um, and, and I do want to say on these things, you know, asbestos is an issue if it's called friable. And we didn't see that anymore. So, you know, we didn't see any, any instance where there was a safety concern. If we did, we would have brought it to the attention of the administration right away. Uh, so, you know, that's not something that, that is necessarily a concern. But if you do these projects, you need to address those in the appropriate legal way. We, we spent, um, I think it was several million dollars, if not more, um, on PCB remediation at the high school. That's part of the issue why we had to redo our source of energy at the high school because of the PCBs in the windows. Mm -hmm. yeah, we just spent on uh, two elementary schools uh, close to $2 million on a change order, which was a result of PCBs leaching into, um, there's a uh, concrete, the structural system was concrete, cast in place concrete, very solid structure. Um, but they eventually, uh, we were taking out CMU and brick and the question was, does it go two feet, three feet from the columns? Eventually, we evaluated all the options, and they said, well, let's take out all the CMU, construct new walls, because we're going to do surface-mounted raceway electrical outlets. And they were able to afford it, fortunately, um, with the buyout in the, in the project. But you know, $2 million, and that's not just the payment, that's also the put-back work, mm -hmm. the new work and stuff. So there's a wide range of, of of course, like you said, it could adversely affect a project if you're not careful. We, we could probably estimate between probably 10 and 15 million yeah. potentially on abatement in all total of five schools. Yeah, we're, we're estimating we're actually going to be demolishing a school uh, up in South Windsor. We're going out to bid soon. Uh, abatement and demo on that one, it's about 42,000 square feet. We're estimating about 1.5 million, but that's mm -hmm. a abatement then we're not doing any put back work with yeah, that. So we have to tweak that in two million. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if I might, um, the reason why we put this note in there so that the conversation did not that we were you know transparent mm -hmm. in this regards that you know this is just the priority list and we do realize that our schools have that million dollar pot. Yeah, it is there, but it's the, the, the toolbar at the, to, at the bottom. I don't know how to get rid of that. Hides, uh, hides the bottom of these slides. Okay. Okay. So, you know, it is a technical study. So we want to look at that same priority breakdown across um, each of the major building components. And when we do that, we found that the exterior shell is the area that across the schools uh, combined represents the largest area of need, both in terms of total dollars as well as party dollars. That comes back to the roofs and the windows, uh, fixing the masonry and the walls, exterior doors, all of the kind of the shell items um, that you know, have not received a lot of attention over the life of these buildings. HVAC is the second largest area of need. Uh, so we've talked about that a bit and uh, followed by the electrical and the interior shell. So those are, those are kind of the, the big components um, of where we found most of the needs. When you talk about the HVAC, mm -hmm. um, I taught in Hamner for a lot of years and I had a, I didn't have anything for about 25, but, and, and maybe about my 26th year, they put in those window unit things right into the wall right that's not what you're talking about here that, that's that some, that's some of it yes some of it? yes okay. so some you know a lot of lot, standard classrooms they put a what's called a unit ventilator it's the big box that yeah. goes in the wall and has a vent on the outside yeah. um that draws fresh air in and then it heats and cools that generally heats but yeah. you know sometimes now they, they cool too but for the most part back in the day they just did heating and ventilating yeah. um and you know, over time, um, they become more and more inefficient. Yeah. The, the dampers that allow how much fresh air to come in 
I start to freeze. I, and I get it. It's, <laughs> yeah. So that's the big thing, what we're talking about. Yeah, it was not comfortable. But I was just wondering if you're talking about those units that we put in the, actually in the walls that, you know, I had a remote to run it from my desk. You know, oh, you're talking about the remote air conditioners? Yeah. Oh, those, okay, yeah. Is that what Sorry, those, so the window air conditioners at the yeah, walls. When you say the HVAC, is that? Yeah, the, well, a lot of the schools don't have that. that. That would be part of that system. Now I'm not, you know, that that's not, that piece of it's not so bad. Um, it's not the most efficient way no. to air condition a building. No. It, it, you know, you've got all of those little units in each, one in each classroom that, it's fine. cold right at the unit and warm at the far end and air doesn't circulate properly and they're noisy and there's so many of them that yes. becomes hard maintenance. Yes. yes. That's, part, that's part of this. Yes. HC. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing to keep in mind is we, you're seeing these large bars, these vertical bars in different pots of money in different systems, but these systems all touch each other. Um, you, 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 just like your home, and I'm going to really simplify this here. You're not going to put a brand new HVAC system um, and electrical and all of these interior improvements if your roof's leaking and if your windows aren't efficient and properly sealed and you have a, a, a really good, what we call the building envelope, it's the skin. Mm -hmm. um, so th th these are related to each other, you know, even though we're categorizing those, um, but is, if you were to look at these over the course of time and start prioritizing which ones do we do first, um, a lot of times, say, hey, let's get the HVAC in and get it comfortable. But if you're bleeding out energy throughout your your building envelope, and it's leaking air or it's bringing air in, which you don't want um, either, um, you have to look at these imbalances as a whole. So these, these all these systems work together. They're not isolated, as maybe the graphic may depict. Um, so as we're looking at these moving forward in the next steps, um, that that's what we have to look at uh, and, and take into account because there is certainly. Uh, in another district we looked at, we said, well, you got to do the roof, and you should probably do the windows, maybe not the whole skin, um, before you do the electrical and HVAC uh, upgrades. And then it comes into security issues. You don't want to put in fixed windows um, for security reasons, because if you don't have H HVAC in, uh, in the system, then, then you got a hot building. So there's a lot of factors that go into the future steps of these. But these are all closely integrated together. Um, they're not standalone. <clears throat> yeah. In your review of these buildings, um, was there any building that you saw that we really should? No, it's a nice segue to the nice to the next or slide. Rebuild or let, 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 let's are you confident that this money that would bring obviously bring all the buildings up to code and so forth, but would get us how many more years? You know, structurally, there we didn't see any major concerns. You know, there's some little areas here and there where we're seeing, you know, some cracking masonry that we're saying, all right, you ought to take a look at that. But it's a, it's an isolated area that can be fixed. Um, you know, they all have good bones. There's, you know, there's no reason from a, that the building is going to fail that you need to uh, address it. You know, this slide looks at, we, we equalize all of the needs across a cost per square foot. You know, each building has a different size, so it makes sense that, you know, bigger building might have more dollars. So we want to equalize that by dividing the identified need in that building by the square footage. And when you do that, you know, one thing that you see right away is that Highcrest has the highest need. However, what's important is the red bar. Those are the, those are the urgent needs. And that's showing that Hamner and Charles Wright have the most urgent relative need. Um, but, you know, when, when you're looking at a total need of, you know, $120 a square foot to $140 a square foot, a new building is going to be, you know, $400 a square foot. So none of these are at the point where you would say, boy, rip it down strictly from a condition. Now, as you start to factor in all these other things and, you know, do you want to spend, you know, um, you know, six and a half million dollars to get Charles Wright fixed versus improved for, you know, fixed for what it is. Um, you know, that's a discussion now where you start to factor in, um, you know, enrollment projections and um, program needs and whether, you know, it makes sense to take instead of spending, you know, you know, uh, five to ten million dollars on, on each bill on two buildings to maybe 
put that together onto one building and replace them. You know, those are the kinds of discussions you can start to have um, before making a you know, commitment to spend that kind of dollars. Yeah. And that's a subjective call because you know, what percentage of the building do you spend, or it's like a piece of equipment, I'm a, am I gonna spend 50% of the value on a vehicle it, just to repair it versus buying a new one mm -hmm. uh, or, um, or replacing um, that? And then the other factor down the road is, okay, well, you know, again, high press, okay, seven, uh, 7 .9 million do we have up there? Okay, if you're replacing that building, okay, here's the total cost. What's our, what's our cost versus the reimbursement from the state as well? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and that percentage, a lot of those factors are coming down the road, of course. Yeah, but much of this work is not reimbursable. Some of it is, but much of it isn't. Yep. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but this, what we're talking about, Say the school was built in 1956 mm -hmm. or 1966. What we're talking about is to get that back to when it was built in 1956. Or to some lot, extent, yes. I mean, you know, we're really we're really you, thinking about it, current standards for the space. So you know, where there is you know uh, no air conditioning in a gym, but it's used heavily in the summer, we have a project in there to, that you know, and, and the air handling unit is way beyond its useful life for the rooftop unit, whatever is providing the HVAC, we'd replace that and add air conditioning to bring it to a usable current building, but we're not you know, putting in a new floor and putting in you know, modern um, bleachers and everything else to bring it to today, but it's, it's a little bit of a mix. You know, the, the, the key is we're not changing walls. We're not adding program spaces. We're not, you know, looking at classroom sizes and saying, boy, you know, that doesn't meet our standards or, you know, art rooms are too small. We're not looking at any of that stuff. This really is within the, the existing walls and layout what needs to be fixed. So we're bringing the infrastructure basically up to 2018 levels. Yeah, and, and I think for the most part. Sally, Sally's here and, and she had a, a great analogy in our meetings of this is the unfun stuff. This isn't the yeah. pretty stuff we're looking at. This is all the stuff behind the walls that nobody sees, but you feel it. You feel the comfort, you, feel, you know, energy efficiency. Hopefully some, your costs go down on, on energy, but that's, that could be debated. It rarely does, actually. But, but this isn't the fun <laughs> stuff, the visual stuff that everybody likes to see, the new entrance and windows in the new paint and the new floors. It's the creature comforts that, um, that really need to be um, invested in at some point. Uh, for the indoor, for the health of your students, and, and that's really what it's about is is that and, and their well-being in their teaching environment and making that comfortable, and for your staff as well. Well, I, I would add, you know, when you look at our buildings, you know, dating back to the from the early '50s with additions at, at Emerson Williams to you know late '60s, early '70s, you know, many of our schools were designed in the open classroom model, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, in this day and age, it just doesn't fly anymore with safety and security. And you know, one of the issues, and I look at Charles Wright as a perfect example, Charles Wright has been so cut up over the years to create additional classroom space or additional programmatic space that you've gotten to the point where there's just, there's no more room and there's no more acceptable room that's, that's top notch for student learning. Mm -hmm. So that, that therein lies a real challenge. And, and it's, you know, frequently so many of the programs get, you know, shoehorned into closets and old, um, you know, locker rooms and everything else. And, you know, we're not addressing any of that. We're just assuming that that is what it is now and painting the wall and replace the ceiling and making sure that it has appropriate air, air you know, heating and air conditioning, ventilation. Um, and some of these also, like we're talking about like roof replacement. I mean, perfect example, we renovated a, a middle school in, in, down in North Haven. Uh, it was a renovation project, but we called to replace the roof. The one thing we don't get to see is the steel decking that goes in there. It was Swiss cheese, um, and, and that's what we don't get to see. And, and these inspections are very, very visual and very surface visual. Like we're sitting here, and, and like you have a home inspector inspecting. So, um, you know, there are there is a certain amount of unknowns too that if we replace a roof, if you rip it, you take it all the way down to the deck. So we really open that up, where yeah. we just but, don't know what right. that is. But at the same time, you know, we, we use the information that we best have. So where there is, you know, in some, several cases there were attic spaces. 
Uh, you know, we would go in there and we would look at the deck. We would look for signs of deterioration. Um, you know, you look for how many leaks there are and where they are and, you know, how many patches. The more patches, that means the more water that's coming through, which means probably you better factor in some contingency for deck work. So we do try to do our best based on the information that we have at hand to account for those things. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chip, as we're looking at this, so the total is $32 million, and what we yep. do is we get our schools stable yep. so that they're right. But that does not include if we find hazardous materials in them, right? Because that hasn't, with, with, right, we, yes. uh, we were told that early right. on that that would not be. So $32 million is without any of that information about right. hazardous materials, yeah. Or with stuff behind walls. Right. Uh, some, I mean, you know, where, where, there, where there were schools where there were, you know, many um, plumbing issues reported or evidence of leaks, we would factor in, you know, replacing uh, the, the piping behind the, the uh, walls. So we, we do our best to try to, you know, limit the number of surprises. But, yes, there could be more that, that we wouldn't know. And Diane, from your experience at the high school, you're estimating another $10 million for the... PCBs and well, you average it right average it to two rises, but yeah, so it'd still be 30, I mean, 40 million. Yeah, but still, with if you have you're spending 40 million to get every single elementary school up to where it should be, whereas it's going to cost you at least 65 million to build a new elementary school just to fix them. You're, you're talking about. $30 million just to fix it with limited well, state reimbursement. Well, yeah, but to bring it all, everything up to code, everything, so the infrastructures of the schools mm -hmm. are at the 2018 level. But to build a brand new elementary school, it's going to cost you somewhere in the $60 million range. Depends what size you're looking at um, in your enrollment. Um, I mean, we have hard facts on that. Um, we just built uh, a 576 enrollment up in South Windsor. Uh, 76,000 square feet for um, total project cost is 32 million. Well, 32 million. Day. So, but to build a new elementary school at 32 million, mm -hmm. we're still going to have another 20 million. Correct. To bring all the rest, the rest of the schools yeah. up to mm -hmm. speed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I, you know, it's certainly an interesting discussion in one of these, and you're, you're weighing them out, and you know, you, you know, renovate them, build them new. Fix them. That that that's the big struggle uh, moving forward. I have one quick question. Um, you've uh, laid out obviously all the variables and the estimated cost. We all know those are flexible numbers. So it, you know it's sort of like when you do a uh, you, you fix your own house mm -hmm. and you know what that's going to cost. Mm -hmm. um, but we rarely budget for what it's going to cost to keep it that way going forward. Mm -hmm. So if we if our if our our situation is we've been able to, we've had to defer things, we've had a, you know, just general age, we've had to deal with the realities of budgeting, we've tried to put bubble gum and spit and whatever on things to get them through another year. We spend this money, we bring everything up nice and shiny, everything's code, you know, our bathrooms are nice, everything, and then we go forward again. Mm -hmm. And then, do, uh, is there a way for you to extrapolate what a ongoing maintenance budget would be generally for these buildings going forward to maintain them to some level of at least code so we're not turning around in five years coming back when the schools are all beaten up again I guess is my question so that we can sort of have an honest discussion about what we should be honestly budgeting in the out years to keep these schools up and running so we're not asking for a big ask maybe two big asks of the public to get our schools up to the standards that we want them to be yeah, I mean it's it's a little more complicated, uh, you know, in the in the public arena where it's harder to really start de developing large reserves, so that you know in year one you start putting a little bit of money away, so that in year twenty you can replace the roof. Um, you know, there's so you know if you you know address all the issues, there's going to be less maintenance early on. I agree. Yeah. Uh, but. If you do it all at once, that means you're going to have a point in year 10, year 15, year 20 where you're going to have a lot of exposure uh, as all the systems come due at the same time. Um, I guess that gets to my point. Which, of, which, which, <clears throat> which you know, you, if you start reserving, well, we have, a, you we, have a reserve, we have capital reserve, right? So yeah. that's for big projects. But we, I don't know, in the past, we've had an actual maintenance reserve mm -hmm. 
that you can, you know, based on ages and wear and tear. I mean, I know it's all guesstimating. A lot of it is. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just something to consider no, if yeah, you're going to go yeah, out and just, ask people to bring. We a similar plan, 10-year plan. Yeah. Um, down in Madison. Uh, and uh, they filled a referendum for a new school, and they have, I don't know how many projects that we, we worked on it, and distributing those plans out, working on similar to this, and putting those out for 10 years and assigning <coughs> dollars per school per year and some years are 15, 16 million dollars for district wide. And you go, how do, how do you budget that? Um, but in addition to that, is staffing uh, of maintaining it is that staffing is always uh, a tight one in most districts. There's never enough custodial maintenance staff having that. And, and also the staff is higher qualified now to if you want to hire an in-house staff for your HVAC systems, mm -hmm. that, that, th those, those men and women are very high qualified and they have to know those systems very yes. well. Computerized systems, digital controls. It's no longer just cleaning the filter and, and, and the unit ventilators and so forth. They're very complex systems. So that staff cost alone to, to, to do that program in addition to whatever uh, project dollars has to be taken into consideration. That, that's always a tough discussion when you're talking with the budget. You mean we can't call Sears and have him come down on Tuesday? Because <laughs> I got to come in tomorrow, I can ask him. It might be worth it. They might, they might. You know, one of the things we're thinking of, too, as we um, move along, now we have all this information and we look at it, we have to remember that these are not empty shells. There are children and staff living in them 181 days. And so that has to be taken into consideration if we do find hazardous materials in these buildings, which is a probable, correct? Um, we actually have to get them out. Right. I mean, so there's so many things that have to be considered after we've gotten all this information on how um, this goes forward. And I think something of a priority is the children and the staff. Right. And yeah, and that, that becomes part of the next kind of planning phases is looking at different options. Mm -hmm. Options of repair and additions and new construction and, and you know, what the different costs are. Uh, what do you save if you do certain things? What are the additional costs? What's the impact on uh, learning? Because many of these projects are not summer projects. They extend much longer than that. So all those things need to be taken into consideration, um, you know, in adding on some of the demographic, you know, changes through parts of the town going forward. Now, what about the middle school? We haven't looked at that yet. That's okay. the next the next building we're going to be looking at is the middle school and do this same level of analysis on the middle school. Okay. We just haven't gotten there yet. And you know, the idea there with regard to the middle school is really not so much for any type of renovation, but it's to identify long range capital improvements uh, for, for planning purposes with our shared services model. We also looked at it to see if we put the sixth graders there <clears throat> and it does not have the capacity. Right. Mm -hmm. did, but did we, did you look at Say we were to consider putting like fifth and sixth graders at Webb or one of those at one of those schools. Did you look at whether any of the schools? So that'll come that? down the road as we get into our options analysis. Okay. Yeah. Okay. See, if John, the, the positive thing is we we hit phase one, mm -hmm. and we tried to get on on track and a target of where we're going. Um, this isn't something that happened overnight. Mm -hmm. You know. The, uh, the steering committee has been meeting <coughs> weekly and putting this together almost a good six months now. And, you know, we wanted to get and identify the needs for the Weathersfield schools. And the enrollment piece, I think, was really critical for us to get. And then now we're identifying what's needed in our schools. Um, and it's no different than what we need at our home. And... You know, let's face it, you know, the kids spend quite a bit of time at school as they do at their house. So we want to make sure that we set the priority. What we thought is to go with all elementaries, not just one. We felt that it needed to be district-wide, and so that's what we're doing. As we get into the next phase, we'll get into the options as was discussed. But I think that this is a good starting point to bring it to the next level. And the conversation really has to continue. It's not something that we can put to bed and say, okay, we did it, it's gonna send the shelf. 
I think we're motivated enough to know that it needs to be done, you know, and it's, it needs to be a priority. Kevin? Um, and uh, thank you, that was eye-opening um, to, to both of you, actually. Um, and Mr. Emmett, it was very wise, I think, to have both of these on the same night because although it is a ton of information regarding demographics and the physical plants of our school, one doesn't solve the other. In fact, it makes it much more complicated. The options analysis is going to be fascinating because, I mean, going, you know, $32 million plus, call it 40 plus regarding ab any abatement we may find, that doesn't address the kind of demographic challenges we're going to have in five years and 10 years. We're at 90% capacity right now in five years. You're going to have Charles Wright at over, almost at over 107% capacity, moving on to 112% and over 100% at Highcrest. I mean, these are issues that are not, are not even considered here that is going to take a lot of um, planning and due diligence mm -hmm. on our own part. Um, so it's just, I think it's just, I just want to kind of highlight to everyone here that what's you know not included here <laughs> kind of doesn't, it, this is great information that we is critical for us to move forward, but it's still um, we still have that big demographic challenge we need to look at moving forward. Yeah, th this is really a holistic approach that we're looking at here, and and this the, and, and you know you've, you've had the, the the high school project and and the state is they almost incorporated language and, and legislation that and, and they tell you verbally they want districts to look at the holistic approach, not just one building at a time and, and doing this. These, these, I mean, both of these uh, studies and, and efforts are, you know, they, they work together. Um, they talk to each other, even though they're vastly different in nature, but um, a lot of what Patrick and his team's information is going to help structure what we're gonna recommend and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're, they're both two very important inputs you know, data baseline inputs into the planning that's going to go forward. You can't really have that planning without knowing how many students you're going to have, where they're going to be, right. and right. what what do you need to do to fix the buildings. I mean, you know, you can't. Those are that's the baseline data that now you can start to plan around and, and throw out different options and different configurations and you know different models for repair and all those things and then factor in state reimbursement projections all that you know now now but you've got the information to be able to do that mm -hmm. and for your taxpayers too because you come in with a new project and say hey, we want to build a nice shiny new school taxpayers are going to go wait a minute <laughs> what's your existing <laughs> conditions and so this will help help explain that to these folks in the audience as well so and, and the other thing on the enrollment projections and the studies of where housing is being developed and whether it's a single family or multi, um, that's where the board uh, starts looking at the option of redistricting and to making sure that our buildings are not over capacity like Charles Wright. If it's gonna, if it's gonna be that direction, we've gotta look at a direction where the learning environment is appropriate for what's happening in that building. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's ultimately the most important thing. You know, I, I, I come forward with, you know, a, a need of $32 million. Um, in a way, it's irresponsible to just fix all the buildings completely and have perfect buildings. Your, your mission is to educate kids, mm -hmm. not have perfect buildings. What you want to have is buildings that support that mission, that don't have failures, um, you know, taking away from program spaces. Um, so, you know, Ultimately, that's the most important thing. And how can we best have the Weathersfield building support the educational mission and goals moving forward? <clears throat> Thank you. That was well said. Can I ask one quick yep. question? Mm -hmm. I keep hearing, and I'm newer here, so I wasn't here for the high school and all that stuff, but I hear this word reimbursement. Oh, yeah. I love the word reimbursement. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand exactly what qualifies. Oh, and when you're putting some of these options and all of that, will yeah. that be folded into that yeah. or some of that? Okay. Yeah, so when we get into those future options and we start, uh, and there's going to be a lot of those. There's going to be mm -hmm. a lot of options going around. 
uh, one thing, the, the enrollment numbers, um, they drive square footage of the building. Yep. And that's why we need, besides where do we put them, that'll drive um, the, the maximum size of a school. So the, the state says you can project out eight years and you can build to that maximum eight years. So if we peak out of 700, it comes back to 650 in seven, eight years, you can build to the 700. Um, and uh, But the reimbursement is the state, uh, they have percentages for every single town, 169 towns and districts. Uh, and each have your own percentage rate based upon all the different factors of a town, of course. And when we go through that, we will um, we'll estimate a total project budget for it. We're going to talk about construction, design, Perfect. has every Perfect. contingency. Um, we'll assume what they call ineligible costs because that's what the state will they'll say. Um, certain things are ineligible, like anything outside the property lines. They're not going to pay for us to expand a, a water line down to the new, the new development. Um, that's just one example. There's other ones as well. Um, but they take those off the top, and then they then <clears throat> that eligible portion will apply your reimbursement. And what ultimately that does is it, it says, what's the tax burden to the taxpayers? We'll we'll do a cash flow with your department of finance or your your bond council, whomever might that be, and go for this project. We, here's what we project your cash flow to be, and they can estimate based upon what your current tax burden is. What's the what's the What's the impact of the mill rate and so forth? So that all that kind of comes to play in that big old okay, nasty you. equation. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Chip. Thank you. Okay, that was a bit of information. <laughs> all right, we'll move on tonight. Um, next, we have a first read for our proposed legislative policy updates. Are there any questions for Michael or for the committee? So many policies there that are mandated. Yeah, we did 300 pages in 20 minutes. It was pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, just quickly, uh, we uh, did review all of these. The, the, the list is long. It's mostly a reflection of codifying state laws uh, now into our policies. Uh, I, would, I would urge some of you to, to read at least the ones I thought that's kind of jumped out at me, having to do with student discipline, uh, some very good changes on allergies, um, visitors and observations in schools, um, restraint and seclusion, um, and guidelines for IE, and those were the most voluminous, uh, interesting ones. And we had one on rep mandatory reporting. Mm -hmm. Um, which um, Diane made a, a suggestion to add to and uh, will be reflected in the readings. But uh, all this is uh, done through our uh, attorneys to obviously put us in compliance. But I think it's important that uh, if people can review them or uh, certainly the board, it will uh, speak again to the ongoing um, fun of the state government uh, imposing lots of uh, rules and regulations on us that require uh, even more from our staff uh, on an ongoing basis. So uh, I just want to acknowledge that, um, that reality. And that's it. Okay, anyone for questions on it? Okay, a lot of reading there. Okay, our Board of Ed meetings that we held. Chris, you want to talk more about your policy and planning over there? Gosh, no. no. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, Deborah practically broke the the the, the internet uh, sending this stuff out. I, I feel for her, but it's uh, you know, like again, it's all there. It's very understandable. Um, I, I don't want to belabor it. Let everyone review it. Uh, but again, I think uh, the, the the subcommittee found them that all, all of it to be uh, um, reflective of the realities of, at hand. That we need to do things constantly to. Uh, protect the health and safety of our children and our staff. Uh, I think so, reading some of them, and Mike can jump in anytime you want, um, uh, some of them are going to put a new, more demands and training on staff as well. It's correct. And education, especially among the public, uh, because a lot of these things affect the conduct of the class and the children and the responsibilities of parents, especially parents with their children when they're in our care or in transit transportation part of it as well should be looked at uh, so that people understand the commitment that the school board has and the, s the staff has for their 
safekeeping uh, on their way to school, at school, after school, and on their way home. So that's all. Okay. Elaine? Uh, Chris did a marvelous job that evening as our committee met because there was a volume of work to look at. Um, and he's also mentioned that we should craft a cell phone policy for our district because it isn't in the legislative mandates, which is, I think, a very good idea, very supportive of that. It was a well and, and Mike well is working on it. I, don't want, I didn't bring that up only because it's still in process, but yeah. we are getting a few more um, examples, practical examples, so that we don't uh, obviously go over ground that, that uh, hasn't worked. Uh, this is a important issue, but one that we need to communicate and get um, a lot of input from obviously everyone that it's involved, again, teachers, staff, parents, uh, to have the best, safest, uh, most uh, conducive environment for learning that we can. And that's what we're trying to do here. So, Yeah, and just to, to add to that, with regard to the cell phone policy, I'm researching uh, districts across the country. It's interesting, those that actually have cell phone policies, some talk to the effect of students will give up the cell phones. Others talk about the cell phones are in airplane mode and are in book bags. Then there are other districts that don't have any cell phone policy at all. Um, I did um, reach out uh, to Bristol schools. They were recently in the paper. They are piloting at this point in time. I did not find any formal policy yet listed in their, uh, their policy manual, but they're, they're assessing. Um, and certainly I would look to our um, both students as well as staff and administration at the high school to, you know, to talk about that. Certainly when we go over in the morning, um, the cell phones are out all over the place, um, or the earbuds are in. So, you know, you do have to look at what is the impact on learning. Now with our um, the one to one technology, we have the Chromebooks available, certainly something to take a look at. But again, we'll do it through the collection of data and we want to be methodical and get uh, a lot of input. So that's in progress. Okay. Okay. Ginger, do you want to speak to the correct council? Yes, it was a fairly quiet meeting. It was uh, very lightly attended by uh, the districts that are part of the Capital Region Education Council. Um, the, since the um, legislative session is not started yet, um, there wasn't really any sort of legislative update. Um, they deferred action on the resolution I told you about at the last meeting uh, regarding um, pointing out to the state of Connecticut that they are underfunding the chef magnet schools and that that is costing the town's money because um, Crack has to pay their teachers somehow. Um, some of the other things that happened were, were pretty much just what we just did, what Chris and the committee just did on the policies. They revised some of those their same policies for those same changes at mm -hmm. the state level. And that was about it. We're meeting again on um, December 5th when um, a vote will be taken on this draft resolution um, about um, payment for the chef schools and hope, hopefully getting the state to uh, stick to earlier promises on their funding levels. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Ginger? Okay, thank you again. Uh, and Finance and Information Management Committee, Kevin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief. Uh, we met earlier this evening. Uh, our business manager, uh, Mr. Kazaka, uh, went over the re recent forecasting, uh, noting that we're around $20,000 in the black um, in fiscal year 1920. Uh, this is due, we have some exposure in terms of transportation costs with the Discovery Academy and some outplaced students. Uh, as well as some year-over-year -year exposure and electricity at the high school, which is something we've been it's been ongoing um, for the past uh, since the project's completion, um, and of course we do we still do have our noted of savings um, regarding the para contracts who have not been um, that have not been finalized yet. Those contract negotiations are, are ongoing. Um, beyond that, uh, uh, Mr. Emmett noted that. Uh, We'll bring into discussion next month regarding moving, possible moving into phase two of our um, uh, our facilities plan. Beyond uh, piggybacking on what we saw uh, this evening, um, and also he of course noted that uh, the portables at Highcrest are no longer, and he'll be uh, investigating 
some possible short-term solutions and alternatives. He's in the midst of doing that as we speak. Um, as well as uh, our Mr. Kazaka uh, noted uh, some transportation issues regarding kindergartners. He surveyed his contemporaries um, throughout the state and kind of we discussed kind of the survey responses and what other towns would do regarding their kindergarten transportation um, initiatives. And um, as noted, uh, Ginger had talked about uh, a resolution that CREC is uh, putting before them and we uh, regarding funding for the CREC schools and whether we wanted to kind of sign on to some sort of resolution, but we decided we'd look at, uh, we'd ask CREC for some more further financial information before we made any decisions. Great. Any questions for Kevin and finances? Great. Okay, thank you. So meeting schedule, we do have WEC, which is the Weathersville Early Childhood Collaborative, and they have their annual meeting at the Pitkin Center on Monday, October 29th at 530. Um, is there any unfinished business? John. The socks are up two to nothing, and they're not <laughs> finished. <laughs> <laughs> that was unfinished business. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Is there anyone wishing to make a public comment? Please come on up to the podium and state your name and address. And may I remind you that we have a five-minute limit. Come on up. Hello. Good evening. Rick Gary, 35 Harding Street. I sat through all that, so I feel like I should at least say something. <laughs> um, so I came, um, uh, Councilwoman Bello kind of leaned over and said, why are you here? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm kind of a geek. And uh, I do facilities management for a living, so I was interested in hearing this. A lot of interesting information, a great study, it sounds like. Um, but I, not to put words in your mouth, uh, Diane, but it sounds like you were kind of saying for about $40 million, that's a pretty good deal to get all of our schools up to snuff. To me, that sounds like that's not bad. And it's something we should really push forward. But the town has to make a commitment. What are our priorities? And in the past, I've seen uh, sports fields and, you know, the niceties. Really, people will fill this room and get so passionate. But with the schools, eh, you know, classrooms, eh, and that's wrong. And, you know, <laughs> Look, believe me, I spent the better part of my life coaching and being involved in youth sports, and it's great. But education is what we're supposed to be doing. That's nice stuff, and it, it um, helps with education, but it's not what we're supposed to be doing. So I think the town would support this. And I know a lot of people are talking about this new um, referendum and whether we buy this land or not. And you probably, some of you know, I'm against the purchase of the land for a lot of reasons. But if they build 40 houses, according to these numbers, it's only about 20 new students. Because they're saying a .57 on single family multiplier. Not a big deal, it's not gonna change anything. We have the capacity. So let's take that 2.4 million and the probably 20 or 30 it's gonna cost to build the complexes they're talking about and put it into the schools. I think that's where it should be. That's just my two cents. And my kids were in Charles Wright when those portables were put in. <laughs> Ms. Granato was yes, uh, my son's teacher. I remember. <laughs> so you remember when those portables came in, and they were supposed to be there for a few years. Mm -hmm. We need to fix these schools. Everything else, you know, I don't think yeah. is as, as much a priority. That's it, my two cents. Thank, Thank you for you. all your hard work, everyone. Thanks. For Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, are there any board comments? John? Um, board members on the facilities and maintenance uh, committee received a notice today looking like we'd have a meeting on uh, facilities and maintenance discussing phase one. Has everyone responded? What date is that again, John? Okay, I think it's November 5th, six o'clock. Correct. Okay, anyone else? Anytime yeah. after the 6th, I'm free. Anytime after the 6th. Well, we're going to meet on the 5th. I know. <laughs> All right. So we do have a quorum for having a meeting of facilities and maintenance. Uh, and then the other thing, um, 
last meeting, uh, the superintendent wished Mrs. Silver our 100th birthday wish. That is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, I thought that is a milestone. But I'd also like to wish uh, one of our board members her happy 40th birthday. Kelly uh, uh, Kelly uh, uh, Evans. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not 100 yet, Kelly. This You're 40, though. Still. What? Say hi to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom in on it. <laughs> Happy birthday, Kelly. Thank you very and you much. spent it with us. <laughs> Thank you. All set, John? Thank you. Anybody That's else it. with yeah. a comment? <laughs> Okay, I just have a few meetings to mention. Um, first, we had a vision meeting, which we do have to find a name for it, <laughs> was held on Friday, October 12th, to work on all these organizations that we're putting together and establishing that work for our schools. So we want to be aware of what each organization's doing. So this is a combined effort of the Career Academy Advisory Council you heard Kenny Lesser talk about, um, the Wethersfield Education Foundation, the Board of Ed, and the administration. So going forward, we plan to meet regularly. Um, I also went to the Hunger Action Team on that same Friday, October 12th, and there were reports on the food pantry, food drives, weekend backpacks, school meals, South Sea Middle School initiatives, and the United Way report called Alice. Just wanted to comment on a few of them. The weekend backpacks for the year September 2017 to August 2018, 9,400 backpacks were given out. And those are for weekend food for our children. Um, the food pantry and the food drives continue to show great generosity of our townspeople. The Wethersfield Public School, and I've said this a couple times, will be working on a food drive for the month of November. Um, Silas Dean Middle School, and I find this so rewarding to see these two young students, their eighth graders, Annie, Anna Griffin and Christian Monfisoto, two eighth graders who are working to have the middle school make a difference. So they are setting up, I think it's three activities to um, be food drive fundraisers. The United Way gave a report on ALICE, so it's an acronym for Asset Limited income constrained employed households. And Wethersfield, to, uh, to my surprise, I will say, has 34% of its households in this category. These are not families on the federal poverty level, but these are families that because of so many costs be in housing, child care, and health care um, do struggle. So please check out their website and um, for ways to help these families. And also, we talked about it yesterday about that the board and administration, the school, should be aware um, as we move forward. Um, and I'd like to close tonight's meeting with a personal comment about something near and dear to my heart, and that's the right to vote. I'm proud to say that I voted in just about every election since I became eligible to vote. My parents, when I was in college, would even send me an absentee ballot so I wouldn't miss the opportunity. I've always believed that the right to vote is one of the freedoms that makes America a truly great country. So parents, this is a wonderful way to teach your children about our democratic model. Take them to vote with you. As a parent, you are the role model for your future citizen. Show them the importance of voting. So Democrat, Republican, Independent, whatever, I urge you to take advantage of your right to vote on Tuesday, November 6th. So thank you. So if there's no other comments, we find out what's going on. Oh, Life. Oh, Bobby. Oh, I'm sorry, Elaine? The only thing is when you mentioned all those place, new initiatives we have, the Career Advisory, mm -hmm. the Foundation, those are all wonderful. But we ask that they be put on the calendar because Kenny Lesser just gave us a date and I missed the time. I'll, get, I'll get it all for you. We talked about that we yesterday. We talked about that, yeah. So you, mm -hmm. okay, thanks. I have a note to Deb Murphy to tell <laughs> Deb Murphy to put it on the calendar. <laughs> okay, yes, the, um, that would be the, the um, Academy of... Advisory and the Weatherfield Education yes. Foundation, right. of which you're all invited. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll look both ways this time. Okay. So life at the high school, Eden. Thank you. Well, first off, on behalf of the um, students at Weatherfield High, I would like to welcome Mr. Paul Cavallari as the interim vice principal. Mm -hmm. I, I had the pleasure of meeting him recently, and I think he's really going to be a great fit to our community. And I also have an update for a concern I addressed the last meeting concerning deaf students. Um, I've definitely seen more teachers working towards being more inclusive of deaf students. Um, I'd like to give a direct shout out to Mrs. Shelley Bailey. 
She is the Yukon ECE instructor for the Human Development and Family Sciences. She recently threw all her lesson plan out the window and played a video to educate students about deaf students. So my best friend is in that class and she is profoundly deaf. And so she struggles to hear a lot. So she has two cochlear implants and uses an FM system provided by Soundbridge. But due to the amount of students who talk during class, she can't even hear the teacher who has a microphone less than a foot away from her face. So my teacher played the video and the students immediately stopped talking and realized, oh, holy cow, like this is a real issue. Like this is a classmate that we're taking away the education from. So this really opened up for my friend Brianna. Um, they answered a lot of questions about um, deaf culture and got to learn a lot. And now my classmates are even interested in learning a couple signs. So we've opened it up to every class. We're gonna have like five or 10 minutes dedicated to learning a new sign so we can all communicate and be more inclusive. So I wanted to share that from the high school. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's great. Thank I you. think you found your new uh, focus. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you, Eden. Thank you for informing us. Anyone else? Okay. May I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. A second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all and good night. What's the score? Run for the Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's good. He just he said he had a PTO question. <laughs> oh, you know, Alex, look at